Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Chaya Sande and I am going to introduce you to human pathogenic viruses and their laboratory diagnosis in this session. So, at the end of this session, you will be able to define a virus, you will be able to describe a structure of virus, you will be able to classify human pathogenic viruses, you will know about the pathogenesis and pathogenicity of viruses and you will be able to describe the laboratory diagnosis of viral infections. So, what is a virus? So, virus is the smallest organism, it is the most primitive microorganism we can say without any proper cellular organization. It contains only one type of nucleic acid either RNA or DNA, but never the both kinds simultaneously it does not undergo binary fusion, but it multiplies by a complex process. It cannot grow in size like other living organisms and it has to use machinery of a host cell for synthesis of proteins and for replication. Thus, it is an obligate intracellular parasite. Many human viruses have ability to cause large number of diseases in humans, many of them can be fatal. So, coming to the structure of virus, viruses are extremely small. In fact, the ability of the viruses to pass through the filters which can hold bacteria is the characteristic attribute of viruses. The size of the viruses range between 20 to 350 nanometer and the size can be determined by sedimentation in ultra centrifuge or by electron microscopy. The extracellular particle of virus is known as virion. In the center of a virion, there is a nucleic acid DNA or RNA. It is surrounded by a protein coat known as capsid. Some viruses, they have still an outer covering and that covering is known as envelope. So, the viruses with envelope are known as envelope viruses, without envelope are known as naked viruses. The nucleic acid of virus is either DNA or RNA. The RNA or DNA, it can be either single stranded, so single stranded RNA or single stranded DNA or this can be double stranded, so double stranded DNA or double stranded RNA. The nucleic acid molecule can appear as a linear molecule or it can be uh, seen as a circular molecule. In case of RNA viruses, the RNA strand may be positive sense, negative sense or it could be ambisense. The RNA viruses may have a single strand of RNA or it can have two strands of RNA or there are, various, there are certain viruses which have multiple strands of RNA molecules. The protein coat which surrounds the nucleic acid is known as capsid. The basic function of capsid is to protect the nucleic acids from nucleases that is degradation of nucleic acids from these enzymes. The morphological unit of capsid is known as capsomere. The capsomere is made up of very small number of protein units. Because of the limited genetic material present in the viruses, they are parsimonious in their use of genetic information. The another function of capsid in case of naked viruses to get attached to the host cell membrane. So, the capsid also facilitates the entry of the virus in the host cell. Capsid is antigenic in nature. On the basis of the arrangement of the capsomere in the capsid, three types of symmetries can be seen in viruses. The icosahedral or cubic symmetry, helical symmetry and complex symmetry. In case of icosahedral or cubic symmetry, the capsid has the shape of icosahedron. 
icosahedron is in fact a geometric figure which has 20 sides, 12 vertices and 30 edges. The most important advantage of this figure or this shape is that, that this figure is closest to the sphere. So, that large amount of space becomes available with a limited surface area. The each face of icosahedron has a shape of equilateral triangle. Now, this type of symmetry, icosahedral symmetry, it is seen in all human pathogenic DNA viruses and some RNA vi viruses also have this type of symmetry. The other type of symmetry seen in viruses is helical type of symmetry. Now, in helical symmetry, the capsomeres are arranged around the nucleic acid in the form of helix, similar to the nucleic acid helix. The nucleocapsid in case of helical symmetry, it may be rigid or flexible. All the human pathogenic viruses with helical symmetry are RNA viruses and all RNA viruses with helical symmetry are enveloped viruses. There are certain viruses where the symmetry is not at all clear. This type of symmetry is known as complex symmetry. So, in case of complex symmetry, the capsid cannot be made out distinctly. There is no distinct capsid. In fact, the capsid is buried deep inside the structure of the virus. Such type of symmetry is seen in pox viruses. So, smallpox virus is an example where there is a complex type of symmetry seen in the capsid. Now, there are certain viruses I told you which have an outer covering which is known as envelope. Now, this envelope it is lipoprotein in nature. The lipid part of the envelope it is derived from the host. So, lipids are host derived, but protein is coded uh, by the genes present in the nucleic acid of the virus. The protein subunits which are present on the envelope they are known as peplomers. The envelope virus in case of envelope viruses the envelope with the help of peplomers gets attached to the receptors which are present on the host cells and thus it facilitates the entry in the host cell. Now, coming to the classification of viruses. Now, the viruses they are classified on the basis of various factors. The most important is the type of nucleic acid, the strategy used in the multiplication of viruses, the type of capsid symmetry, whether there is presence of envelope or not the size of the virion and various other physico chemical properties are also considered while classification. The international committee on taxonomy of viruses, when they classify viruses, the family name ends with viridd, the subfamily name ends with virini, whereas the genus name of virus ends with virus. The human pathogenic viruses they have been classified into 25 families and 65 genera. Now, this uh, figure depicts the different viruses RNA and DNA viruses and their relative sizes can be seen. In case of RNA viruses, picorna viruses are the smallest viruses and certain uh, RNA viruses they are very long as long as about 1000 nanometer in size they are phyloviruses, they are not shown in this figure. The smallest DNA viruses are parvoviruses and the biggest DNA viruses they belong to pox viridae or pox viruses. Now, the different families of DNA viruses they can be clubbed together depending upon the characteristic of their nucleic acid. For example, these three families herpes, pox and adenoviridae they have double stranded linear DNA molecule. Whereas, in papilloma and polyoma viridae, the DNA molecule is double stranded DNA which is circular. In case of parvoviruses, there is single stranded DNA molecule and in case of hepatina viridae, there is double stranded DNA which is partially double stranded, it is circular and there is a enzyme present which is known as reverse transcriptase along with the nucleic acid. Similarly, RNA families can also be grouped into certain categories. For example, there are certain families which have single stranded positive sense RNA. In fact, the nucleic acid of these viruses itself is infectious. 
So, when only even if one nucleic acid is injected, it can be uh, infectious and it can multiply or it can be translated directly into proteins. So, these are the different families which have a single strand of positive sense RNA. The there are certain families of human RNA viruses which have multiple segments of RNA and then we have single stranded RNA virus with two strands of RNA along with the reverse transcriptase uh, enzyme. So, this family is retroviridae family. Similarly, there are negative sense single stranded linear RNAs in phylo, paramyxo and rhabdoviridae. We have double stranded RNA multiple segments in Rio viridae and in case of delta virus, there is a single stranded negative sense RNA molecule which is present as a circular molecule. Now, coming to the pathogenicity of viruses, the, the viruses have ability to cause large number of infections in human beings. The oldest recorded infections in the history of human beings like smallpox and polio, they have viral etiology. The viruses can cause trivial infections like common cold and they can also are capable of causing deadly infections like rabies, AIDS and many hemorrhagic fevers. So, depending upon the ability to affect the different systems, viruses can also be classified. So, there are certain viruses which affect respiratory tract like influenza and paramyxo viruses, certain viruses which affect gastrointestinal tract, the important ones are rota virus and norvoc virus. There are different hepatitis viruses and cytomegalovirus which can affect liver tissue. We have many viruses which can cause skin lesions and hemorrhagic fevers like herpes viruses, varicella uh, zoster virus belonging to herpes group of viruses, pox viruses. We have many hemorrhagic fever viruses. So, all they cause lesions in the skin and cause hemorrhagic fevers. Then we have a group of viruses which affect central nervous system like enterohyceresis and rhabdoviruses. Then adenoviruses and herpes simplex virus, they can infect conjunctiva and eye tissues, Coxsackie viruses and Kiko eco viruses, they cause lesions in the cardiovascular system. There are many viruses which can be transmitted via placenta or the infection can be acquired during the birth. So, these viruses cause congenital viral infections. So, important ones are rubella, cytomegalovirus, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV virus, Zika virus, etcetera. So, this is how the viruses can be classified on the basis of the pathogenicity. Coming to the portal of entry of viruses, now most of the viruses they enter the human body via respiratory tract and elementary tract. Some viruses they can be introduced by conjunctival route or via sexual intercourse. Some viruses are introduced via cutaneous route, some are introduced directly to the blood by the bite of vector, some are introduced by the bite of infected animal and some can enter via placenta. Now, coming to viral pathogenesis, pathogenesis is the mechanism by which disease is produced. So, once a virus is successfully introduced in the body, it gets attached to the cells on the various surfaces like mucosal cells or cells on the skin. Then there is attachment of the virus followed by penetration of the virus and replication in the cells. Some viruses remain localized at the site of the entry and they produce disease. So, such viruses they have very short incubation period and the immunity of such viruses is also of a short duration not lifelong. Some viruses they get disseminated from the site of the entry. The dissemination occurs either via blood or lymph. Blood and lymph are the commonest route. They reach the reticular endothelial system. Here they multiply, they again enter the blood stream and from blood stream they reach the target organ where they produce the lesion. So, this is how the viruses they reach their target organs to produce the lesions. So, the outcome of the viral infection depends upon the interaction of the various factors 
the factors are viral factors or host factors. The important viral factors are infectivity of the virus, virulence and dose of virus. A, a virus is said to be more virulent if it can produce more severe disease. The host factors are either non-specific factors or specific immune response produced by the body. The non-specific non immune response is elicited as soon as infection occurs. The most important non-specific immune response is the production of interferon. As far as specific immune response is concerned, both cell mediated as well as humoral immune response take part in the pathogenesis of viral infection. So, the net outcome of virus infection is the integration of all these factors, human factors as well as viral factors. Coming to the manifestations of viral infections, now most of the viral infections they are self limited. The some viral infection or most we can say most of the viral infections are subclinical infections. Subclinical infection means the clinical symptoms they are not overt. The overt clinical infections can be categorized as acute infections, subacute infections or chronic infections. In case of chronic viral infections, the virus it multiplies at a low level and it is associated with the lesions, but the symptoms may be mild or may not be present. And the third category of viral infections are latent or persistent infections, where the virus is present in occult state and from time to time there is flaring up of lesions or uh, manifestations. In case of recurrent infection, there is a long period of quiescence which is followed by clinical manifestations. In case of persistent tolerant infection, the virus is present continuously in the lesions, but there is no immune response and there are no clinical manifestations. So, there is a steady state of affair between the host and the infecting virus. In case of slow infections, there is a very long incubation period and in case of oncogenic virus infections, these viruses they are capable of producing oncogenic changes. There are certain viral infections which are known as or labeled as emerging viral infections. Now, certain infections they are reported uh, from time to time from different regions. Now, these infections these new infections or emerging infections, they could be because of the new agent, new viral agent or there could be abrupt increase in the illness of an endemic viral agent or there could be invasion of new host population by the virus. So, this is a list of different viruses which are known as or which are labeled as emerging viral infections. Now, coming to the laboratory diagnosis of viral infections. Now, what is the rationale why laboratory diagnosis of viral infection is required? The most important thing is that the antiviral drugs, specific antiviral drugs are available for the treatment of many viral infections. So, the specific antiviral treatment can be started. Sometime screening of blood donors is required to prevent the transmission of infection to the recipient. For surveillance of certain viral diseases, the laboratory diagnosis is undertaken for investigation of outbreak and also to start the profile axis in if there is a suspicion of exposure to an viral agent. So, to start the post exposure profile axis viral diagnosis is required. So, there are two strategies which are used for laboratory diagnosis of viral infection. One is demonstration of uh, virus in the specimen direct demonstration and second is indirect method that is demonstration of antibody response. So, in the direct demonstration of presence of virus certain techniques can be used, microscopic examination of the infected tissue can be done for demonstration of virus. The virus can be isolated in culture or detecting the presence of viral nucleic acid is direct demonstration of presence of virus in the specimen. For indirect demonstration we have to demonstrate the presence of specific antibodies in the specimens. So, coming to the specimen collection for the diagnosis of viral infection. Now, when we have to collect specimen for the direct demonstration, the various specimens can be used. For example, in case of respiratory tract, nasopharyngeal aspirates, throat washings or lung biopsy can be used. 
In case of gastrointestinal tract infection, fishes or rectal swabs can be used. In case of central nervous system infection, fishes or cerebral uh, spinal fluid can be used. In case of skin infections, aspirates or swabs from the vesicles are employed. Eye infections, corneal or conjunctival scrapings are used and in case of cardiovascular system, nasopharyngeal aspirates or fishes can be used. If swabs are collected for direct demonstration, then they have to be transported in a viral transport medium like Hanks balanced salt solution, so that the inactivation of the virus is prevented. In case of antibody demonstration, paired sera are required, the two serum samples are collected, one sample at the time of acute illness and the second during convalescence, so that the rising titers of the antibodies can be demonstrated, so that it can help in the diagnosis, this can differentiate between the past and the present infection. The direct demonstration of virus can be achieved by different methods. So, the electron microscopy can be done for demonstration of virus. This is the rapid method for detection of virus particles in the various specimens like fishes, nasopharyngeal swabs and tissues. This is especially useful for the viruses which are difficult to cultivate like rotaviruses and co coronaviruses. The specimen is stained or with uh, negative contrast like potassium phosphotungstate. The surrounding material it gets stained with the electrodense material and the virus morphology becomes clear. The another method of direct demonstration of virus by microscopy is demonstration of inclusion bodies. Now, this is the method traditionally used for demonstration of inclusion bodies in the virus infected cells. The inclusion bodies are supposed to be or believed to be the crystalline aggregates of viruses. These inclusion bodies, they have distinct sides, shapes and staring properties. So, these properties help in the identification of the virus. These inclusion bodies, they can be either intracytoplasmic or intranuclear. As a rule, the viruses which multiply in the cytoplasm, they produce intracytoplasmic which assemble in the cytoplasm, produce intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies. There are some exceptions though and the viruses which assemble in nucleus, they produce intranuclear inclusion bodies. Now, in this figure, you can see this is a inclusion body which is intracytoplasmic inclusion body seen in the neuron from a case of rabies, a person suffering from rabies. These inclusion bodies are very characteristic, they are known as negri bodies and they are the pathognomonic feature of rabies infection. Another example of inclusion body is demonstration of multinucleated giant cells in herpes virus infections. These multinucleated giant cells, they are very characteristic. The nuclei have uniformly stained ground glass chromatin. So, these can help for the diagnosis of viruses like herpes group of viruses. In case of molluscum contagiosum virus, intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies are produced, which are hyaline eosinophilic inclusion bodies. Now, coming to cultivation of viruses in vitro. Now, as we know now that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, so they cannot be cultivated in inanimate culture. So, they can be cultured either in animals or in embryonated egg or in tissue cultures. Actually, it is technically very difficult to use animals for isolation of viruses, but there are certain viruses which can grow only in animals. So, for such viruses, animals are used and also to study the viral pathogenesis, inoculation of viruses in animals is required. The commonly used animals for isolation of viruses are monkey, guinea pigs, rabbits, ferrets and mouse. Very young mouse like suckling mouse is commonly used for isolation of virus like Coxsackie virus. The embryonated egg inoculation is a method commonly employed for isolation of certain viruses. So, fertile egg of 7 to 12 days old age can be used for isolation of virus. This egg offers various sites for inoculation like chorioallantoic membrane, allantoic cavity, amniotic cavity and yolk sac. 
So, depending upon the type of the specimen we are inoculating and the uh, nature of the virus, different sites they are chosen. The virus growth in the embryonated egg, it is uh, indicated by the lesions produced. For example, in case of certain viruses, the lesions are produced on coriolantoic membrane or there will be death of the embryo or there will be the uh, damage to the cells of embryo. So, these are the various methods by which growth of virus in the embryonated egg can be detected. Then coming to the isolation of viruses by tissue cultures. Now, there are three different methods by which viruses can be grown in tissue culture. The first is organ culture. In organ culture, the part of organ, it is maintained in vitro. Certain viruses, they are very fastidious. They grow only in certain types of cells. So, for such viruses, organ culture is required. For example, for isolation of coronaviruses, the slices of trachea, they are maintained in vitro, so that the nutrient fluids can diffuse and the, the differentiation of cells is preserved and the fastidious viruses, they can grow in such highly differentiated cells. It is very difficult to do organ culture, so it is not at all routinely done in the laboratory. The, next, the second type of tissue culture is explant culture where the bits of tissues are maintained in vitro for growth of virus. This is again not routinely performed in the laboratories. The most commonly used technique of tissue culture is cell culture. The cell culture is nothing but cultivation of cells in vitro, which are single dissociated cells, which are allowed to grow to form monolayers. So, different types of cell cultures are available, primary cell culture secondary or diploid cell culture and continuous cell culture. So, for preparation of cell culture, the cells are obtained from tissues. In case of primary cell culture, they are obtained from the freshly cut tissue. The cells are separated by mechanical and by enzymatic treatment. The separated cells, they are washed, they are suspended in a medium and then they are transferred to different containers like flasks, bottles, tubes trays, etcetera. So, when they are suspended in the media and they are transferred to the bottles, the cells they get settled at the bottom and they start multiplying. They multiply and they form a layer at the bottom. Because the multiplication is anchorage dependent, only the cells which get attached to the uh, bottom or surface, they multiply. And because of the contact inhibition phenomenon, the multiple layers are not formed. Two types of culture media are used for virus culture. One type is known as growth medium, which is nothing but solution of balanced and buffered salts, which is added with amino acids, vitamins and serum. The another type of medium is maintenance medium. The only difference between growth medium and maintenance medium is that the growth medium contains high concentration of proteins or serum, so that the growth of uh, cells is facilitated. In maintenance medium, the serum or proteins, they are present in low concentration. So, that the rapid growth is not achieved, the cells, they do not multiply or do not grow, but they are maintained for the inoculation of the specimen. So, the various types of cell cultures used for isolation of viruses are primary cell culture, diploid cell culture and continuous. So, let us see the characteristic of primary cell cultures. For primary cell cultures, the cells are obtained from the normal tissues. These cultures, they contain mixture of cells. So, the cells are susceptible to many viruses. So, they are very suitable for primary isolation of the viruses. The diploid chromosome complement of the uh, cells is maintained and the cells can be maintained in cultures only for limited time. So, these cultures, primary cell cultures cannot be uh, maintained for a long duration in the laboratories. So, it becomes difficult or expensive to use primary cell culture for isolation. These cell cultures can also be used for vaccine preparation. Coming to the examples of the primary cell cultures, human embryonic kidney, rhesus monkey kidney cell culture, human amnion cell culture, cheek embryo cell culture are some of the examples of primary cell culture. Now, coming to the secondary or diploid cell culture. 
for these cell cultures also the cells are obtained from the normal tissue. But in these cell cultures, the subcultures are possible up to 10 to 50 times and the cells in more than 75 percent of the cells no normal diploid chromosome content is maintained. These cell cultures they are also useful for primary isolation as well as for vaccine preparation. The examples of diploid cell lines are human fibroblast cell line or, or cell culture and second is WI38 or human embryonic lung cell strain. Coming to continuous cell cultures, now these cell lines or cells they are derived from malignant tissue. So, they are derived either from the sarcomas or carcinomas. The initial preparation of these cell cultures is very difficult, they can be maintained for unlimited time, they can be subcultured unlimited time. So, though they are not very susceptible to infection by viruses, it is very easy to use them in the laboratories. They contain haploid chromosomes and the examples of continuous cell cultures are HELA which is obtained from carcinoma cervix, HEP2 which is obtained from epithelium of larynx, then KB cell line which is obtained from human carcinoma of nasopharynx. Macaul cell line which is obtained from human synovial carcinoma and Vero which is prepared from vervet monkey kidneys. So, how to detect growth of viruses in the cell culture or cell lines? There are various ways by which the growth of virus in the cell culture can be detected. The most important is cytopathic effects. Cytopathic effects are nothing but the morphological or degenerative changes produced in the cells because of the growth of the virus. When certain viruses grow in the cells, they produce uh, or they make some antigenic changes in the cell surfaces. Because of these antigenic changes, the RBCs they get attached to the cell surfaces. This phenomenon is known as heme adsorption. So, heme adsorption can be used for identification of certain viruses. So, certain viruses have ability to agglutinate, agglutinate red blood cells. So, this process is known as heme agglutination. So, such type of viruses they can be identified by heme agglutination method. All viruses do not produce or cytopathic effect. So, uh, the tissue culture or cell culture can be challenged with a virus which is known to produce cytopathic effect. So, this virus will be inhibited because of the presence of the target virus. So, inhibition of the or of a challenging virus is an example of uh, detecting growth of virus. This is known as interference challenge. The viruses can also be detected by direct immunofluorescence or by electron microscopy or by detection of viral genes in the uh, tissue cultures. So, this is the slide where you can see the cytopathic effect. This is an uninoculated MDCK cell line. So, you can see there is a single sheet or monolayer of the cells without any spaces in between and on the right side you can see the cytopathic effects have been produced because of the growth of the virus. So, you can see the spaces in between the cells and there is enlargement of the cells. So, these are the morphological changes produced in the cells which helps in the identification of the virus. The cytopathic effects usually seen are rounding of cells, syncytium formation or clustering of the cells or formation of inclusion bodies. There is usually the growth of virus in the cell culture takes time. So, this is a time consuming technique we can say. So, there is one advancement has been done to enhance the rapidity of this technique and that is known as centrifugation enhanced rapid cell culture or also known as shell vial culture. It is nothing but the uh, similar to the conventional uh, cell culture. The only thing is that the cells are grown on a cover slip in a small vials and the after inoculation of the specimen centrifugation is carried out. So, that the virus immediately gets attached to the uh, cells in the cell culture and then the growth of virus in the cell culture is detected by uh, using monoclonal antibodies. This type of technique can be used for rapid detection of viruses like cytomegalovirus and herpes virus. Coming to the third method of direct demonstration of 
viruses in the specimen and that is by antigen detection. Now, this method of antigen detection is very useful for detection of viruses which are very difficult to grow in culture. This is also a rapid method of detection of virus growth. Various methods of antigen detection are available like serological uh, techniques like enzyme linked immunosorbent assays, direct immunofluorescence test, latex agglutination test and various immunochromatographic assays can be used for detection of antigens in the specimen. The last method of direct demonstration is detection of nucleic acid in the specimen. Now, these are very rapid, sensitive and specific techniques. So, various methods are used. So, because they are rapid, sensitive and specific, they are becoming very popular in diagnostic virology laboratories. So, there are various methods available. The nucleic acid probes are nothing but the short segments of nucleic acid which are labeled with enzyme or chemiluminescent molecules. So, these segments they are complementary to the target nucleic acid which is present in the specimen. So, here the amplification is not required. So, just using these probes directly the nucleic acid segments can be detected in the specimen. This is very useful for detection of certain viruses like human papilloma virus. The second very popular technique is polymerase chain reaction. In the polymerase chain reactions, it involves the extraction of nucleic acid from the specimen, the denaturation for separation of the strands of the nucleic acid. For example, in case of DNA, the two strands are separated. This is followed by the amplification of the individual strand and then multiplication. So, the multiplication is uh, uh, achieved. So, large number of copies of nucleic acid are produced after the uh, completion of the reaction and the amplified products they can be detected either by electrophoresis or using specific probes in hybridization technique. Now, besides nucleic acid probes and polymerase chain reaction, the other methods commonly used are reverse transcriptase PCR and real time PCR and real time RT PCR. Now, these techniques they are very useful uh, for not only for detection, but also for the quantification of the nucleic acids. So, these are very useful for the estimation of the viral load. So, basically in reverse transcriptase PCR reaction or test, uh, the RNA of the RNA viruses, it is first reverse transcribed to a complementary DNA using enzyme reverse transcriptase. Now, this complementary DNA, it is further amplified with the help of polymerase chain reaction and then it can be detected. So, many RNA viruses like influenza virus, para influenza virus, dengue virus, SARS coronaviruses. For these viruses, this reverse tran transcriptase PCR technique is used. These were the tests for direct detection of virus in the clinical specimen. For detection of specific antibodies, various tests are available, but as I told you in the beginning, we have to have two samples for detection of antibodies, so that we can demonstrate the increase in the titers of the specific antibodies. So, the various methods used for the detection of antibodies are heme agglutination inhibition test, neutralization test, complement fixation test, enzyme linked immunosorbent assays and flow through chromatographic assays. So, they are useful for rapid diagnosis of many viral infections. So, summarizing what we have learned so far. So, the viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They contain only either one type of nucleic acid, either RNA or DNA. Viral diseases range from minor, minor diseases like common colds to deadly diseases like AIDS and rabies. ELISA and immunogrammatographic are the commonly used techniques for the diagnosis of viral infections. Molecular diagnostic methods are rapid, sensitive, specific and bec are becoming very popular and they are becoming the mainstay in the diagnostic virology. Thank you.